Okay, so I think we showed this on the very first day, uh, the different sort of categories of reservoir simulators out there. You have your commercial simulators, CMG, of course, we're using in this class, but the other big one is Eclipse. I'd say between Eclipse and CMG, those two probably have like 80% of the market share. It was by far the most two, uh, the two most used uh, reservoir simulators. There's a couple other ones. Intersect is a joint project between Slinger and Chevron. Um, in fact, on the first Monday after Thanksgiving, I think it's like the 29th of November, one of the Intersect developers who's a colleague of mine at Summer Joe is going to be here to give a graduate seminar. So right after this class uh, in that room over there, he'll be giving a seminar if you're interested. Uh, then you have your in-house simulators. So basically every major, you know, every super major, every major service company that has sort of a research department, they're going to have their own in-house simulators. Um, even the ones that have the external ones probably have internal ones. Um, you know, like, like obviously Cheers is for Chevron and they also have Intersect. Uh, Intersect is a product they sell, but Cheers is an in internal product that they use probably uh, for research to develop Intersect, but also a lot of the in-house simulators will include a lot of their own proprietary data sets, you know, so the actual users running the simulator uh, can just sort of, a, from a menu or from some easy access, access multiple data sets that's sort of built into the code. Um, so th that's a lo lot of reason they're proprietary. They don't want to release that information. And then of course the academic codes Couple, well, three of the four on the list are basically from UT, UT Chem, which is probably the world's leading chemical EOR simulator. It's been developed here for 20 or 30 years. IPARS is a code by Mary Wheeler. Uh, GPASS is Tommy Sepinori's compositional flow simulator. We'll talk a little bit about at least IPARS and GPASS a little bit. And then TUF2 is an open source code from Lawrence Berkeley Rational Labs. So, uh, of course, it, you know, it's a reservoir simulator. So we can solve petroleum problems, of course, but uh, it's also used a lot for like environmental stuff and ca contaminants, uh, transport, um, geothermal stuff like that. Um, so you can actually go and, and download that. <coughs> um, we talked a little bit about. I mean, we derived the gas equation. Um, for multi-phase flow, but it was when we sort of went into looking at how you might solve it or looking at impasse, we, we got rid of it, you know. Um, the, the gas equation is a little more difficult than the other ones because uh, in water and oil, it's a valid assumption to say the compressibility is small, right, and, and uh, the, the total system compressibility is a constant, so we just sort of add those guys in. But that's not a valid assumption under gas where you can have very, very high compressibility. And so in a gas equation, your density is a function of uh, uh, pressure. And, uh, and so you have to include that. And what you end up with is a, is a nonlinear equation in pressure. Right? So you see the nonlinearity in the second term there uh, in pressure. And so there's sort of two ways to handle that. Uh, maybe an old way. I don't think you would do this anymore. An old way would be to use this pseudo pressure, which is sort of this mathematical function that accounts for the compressibility. And then you plug that in and you solve the linear problem. Uh, I'd say the more robust or the more accurate way, and really no, no reason nowadays with big computers uh, uh, not to do this, is you just solve the fully nonlinear equation. So when we solve a nonlinear equation, we have to use the Newton Raphson method. Because if you notice, like, the transmissibility matrix is a function of the pressure. The accumulation matrix is a function of the pressure. Right? And so the nonlinearity is very clear because you have a pressure over here multiplying the pressure that shows up in those terms. So you can't just invert this matrix to solve this equation. Right? So when we solve nonlinear problems, a lot of times what we do is we define some function. And we basically solve, you can, you can almost even just not even look at that. And we say that there's a function of pressure that's equal to 0. And we solve that equation via Newton Raphson method. And so, you know, how you go about doing that. Okay. Right, so Newton Raphson. 
we're going to say that that function, and it's a vector fun, it's a vector, right? It's a vector. F is a vector. And we're going to do a Taylor series expansion of that guy about the time step n. Right, so the time step n is where things are known. So we have f and n plus So this guy's evaluated at step n times pn plus 1 minus pn. So that's, that's not, I don't like that. You're going to think that's to the nth power. Let's do this. Evaluated at n. Evaluated at n. So there's our Taylor series expansion. And what we'll do here is we'll say that Just like we did before, we're going to use a big O notation to say that you know, we have F at N plus some matrix, right? So that partial F, partial P, P, F and P are both vectors. So if you take the partial derivative of a vector with respect to a vector, you get a tensor or a, or a matrix, right? A second order tensor or a matrix. So that guy's a matrix, and we're going to call it KT. So this is like the notation there comes from finite elements, really. Is this, the, the name for that guy is the Jacobian or the tangent stiffness matrix, okay? So then we have this equation. And what we're going to do is, w what we want to do is we want to solve this in a way that drives this guy to zero, right? So remember our equation was F of something equal to zero, right? So if I were to just take the pressures, just, you know, imagine I had a thousand by thousand grid, right? So I have a million pressures. And I were to just guess them, or I were to just make up numbers and stick them in there. Would that equation equal to zero? Not unless I'm the luckiest guesser in the world, right? So what we do essentially is we stick in, you know, we guess the pressure, we stick in numbers, and then we use this procedure to update or drive the pressure in incrementally to zero, okay? And for, uh, for tangent stiffness matrices, the KT, that are well behaved, symmetric, uh, positive, definite, then the error will act is actually, the convergence rate is quadratic. So the, the error cuts by a factor of two every time. Right? It gets cut in half every time. And so then if we solve this equation, so KT is the Jacobian matrix. Also, you know, in FEA, the finite element method, we call this the tangent stiffness. And that's equal to partial F, partial P. Again, evaluated at step N. Okay. So then, delta P is equal to minus kt on minus 1 half n. I'll just leave off the evaluated at n. We'll get rid of that. So then the increment, the incremental change in p would be then used to update pn plus 1. And you continue to do that until some convergence criteria is met. Converge when 
Maybe I should have used a different. I don't want to be, I don't want to confuse you here. This n is not a time step. It's a step in the newton raphson iteration. So it's, it's, it's one step in the iteration. And you can continue to do this until some convergence criterion is met. <coughs> There's lots to choose from. This one maybe you know, is the sort of relative error between one step and the next when it reduces below some criterion. So you'd have to do this, in fact, local iterations, Newton iteration, for every time step. Right? So if you had a time step, you'd, you know, you'd take a step in time, you'd write your residual equation, you'd minimize it. Essentially, this is what this is, an optimization or minimization routine. You're minimizing the error in the residual. You're, m you're minimizing the error in the residual of this by changing the values of p. You know? So you're, you're, you're continually up updating p until that equation gets as close to zero as possible. Right? So then once you have a converged iter iterate, you take another step in time, evaluate the new <coughs> residual, and go through the whole process again. So this is how you solve nonlinear equations. In, uh, in Python library, there's a, I use a Newton-Krylov solver. It's very efficient for doing this. In, for large-scale problems, I'm not sure about MATLAB what the what the actual command is to do this for large problems. For small problems, for small problems, you can use some like fmin search. I think fmin search is an optimization uh, command in MATLAB. And of course, in 1D, what's the nonlinear solver in 1D? This is zero, isn't it? Or f zero? It's f zero. F0? I think so. Never solved a nonlinear equation in that way? I think it's F0. I'm sure you did in 310. <laughs> anyway. So you use that procedure to find what Pn plus 1 is in solving this equation. And you see delta t is in there, right? So then you'd increment delta t and you'd do it over again. <laughs> so capillary pressure and gravity we talked about, but then of course immediately when we went on to solve some problems, we ignored it. But basically when you go to 3D, obviously you have to have gravity. It's pretty straightforward how you handle it. You, um, you just replace the pressure uh, in the diffusivity equation with the pressure plus rho gh. And when you implement the discrete form, uh, <coughs> then the equation just has on the far right hand side, you have that additional g over there, which is because, you know, this is something you, the, the height is known, right? So in the, in the spirit of writing the things we don't know on the left and the things we, we know on the right, well, the, the height, z, right, at anywhere in the reservoir is something that's known. Of course, the T matrix is what it was before, so that's that's all known stuff. And then you have your capillary pressures, which you know for the capillary pressure you just need uh, you, you need some type of constitutive model, right? So if you saw it's a multi-phase problem, you're solving for the oil and water pressures, or you know you're solving for w one of the pressures, you can <coughs> post-process the other one through your capillary pressure equation. So 3D and radial geometry, again, we just sort of talked about it. Again, the, the main difference is 3D, you have to include the types of gravity. Uh, the structure of the equation is the same, but your T matrix, of course, instead of being, uh, it's now going to be heptadiagonal instead of being pentadiagonal. So you have two more um, off-diagonal entries associated with the third dimension. So if you remember, when we went from 1D to 2D, we went from tridiagonal to pentadiagonal, so we gained two, right, off diagonal entries. So same deal when you go to 3D, you gain two more associated with that. Um, you know, for, uh, you can use the radial diffusivity equation, and, you know, what you can do is you can just use a, uh, uh, you can either discretize this directly, or you can use a, uh, 
trans coordinate transformation that you know says that r is or r squared is equal to x squared plus y squared, and you can just put it back into Cartesian coordinates and, and solve it uh, that way. So this is really a topic that's the, the kind of a big research area in, in uh, reservoir simulation, particularly associated with unconventionals and, and fractures. And they sort of all go together with horizontal drilling or horizontal wells, right? Because uh, they're, they're sort of all three associated with each other. Unconventionals, horizontal drilling, and, and then we complete those wells with typically with some type of stimulation via hydraulic fracture. So horizontal wells, there was one slide when we talked about well models on how to handle them. It's not that difficult. It's just now your, your well is going to track across multiple grids. And every grid location that it crosses is going to have its own productivity index associated with it. Um, you may want to use a horizontal well in your project. Uh, it's up to you. Uh, when you when you have to design your own reservoir. Um, for fractures, though, th this is really an area, and I'll talk about one method of sort of discrete fracture modeling. Um, but typical conventional reservoir simulators on finite difference grids do not handle fractured reservoirs very well, hydraulically stim stimulated reservoirs very well. Because th the sort of typical or classical approach was to use some type of dual porosity or dual permeability model. These models work well. I mean, they were essentially designed for fractured reservoirs. But they, they work well when the fractures are sort of um, dispersed in a normal distribution. So you have some matrix permeability, which is your normal, you know, say core data permeability, and you have larger scale features like fractures that have some second permeability. And if they're all equally distributed and equally dispersed, there's a slick way, this dual permeability, dual porosity models of averaging those features so that you can just solve sort of a straightforward reservoir simulation. The problem is with hydraulic fractures, they're not equally and well dispersed, right? I mean, they do connect to natural fractures and give some complexity, and that's what that's why shells produce. Um, but at the same time, they're, they're not in any way sort of equally dispersed everywhere. They're very sort of discrete, uh, localized things. And so really, you, you need to do something special to treat them. And one approach is to use a discrete fracture model where you're actually resolving them, and you're having the mesh conform to them. Um, you're going to do some history, history matching when you when you run uh, CMG. CMG's module for history matching is called CMOST. Okay, so when you're using CMOST, this is essentially what you're doing. And the argument for history matching is that well, how are you going to? You would use history matching in a case where you have some data, like production data, right? So if you had a if you had a field that was being produced, and you had data, then you can build your reservoir model. You can run the forward simulation to try to predict what's already happened. Right? And the argument is, if you can't predict what has already happened, how are you going to predict the future? Right? And then you can, you know, if you can predict what's already happened, then that can give you some idea of how to further develop your field. Right? You know, put a well here, do that, do this. Right? Well, and it's certainly a useful tool, and it's certainly necessary. I mean, I, I tend to agree with the idea that if you can't predict the, the past, how are you going to predict the future? The, the problem associated with history matching is it can, it's, it's not just a a blind thing because if you have enough variables, right, and in like some comp compositional flow simulator, you might have 500 inputs, right? And if you have enough inputs, you can match anything, right? So the matching is, is an optimization routine. So the idea is that you're trying to match the production history or, uh, you know, s certain outputs. And uh, if you turn the knobs on the inputs enough, you, you you can get it to match, always. Uh, the problem is, is that the resulting numbers may not be physical. Right? You can, I mean, like what would a porosity of 1.2 be? Right? You know, but it can certainly, if you don't constrain the optimization routine in some way, uh, the history matching could give you a result that looks like that. Now, that, that one is probably a little bit too obvious. I mean, I'm sure. Like in CMOS, there are probably certain constraints to, to violate things like a porosity with a value of greater than one, right? Because it is a constrained optimization routine. But there are other scenarios like, you know, if you're 
if you're trying to history match a shale reservoir, where you know from laboratory experiments the shale has nanoducts of permeability, but the thing produces like crazy. Right? We don't really know why. So if you just turn that over, if you just turn that over to CMOS or, or to history matching program, it might turn tune the permeability to the extent that now, you know, the permeability is 10 or maybe one milladarcy. Those are realistic numbers, right? There are real reservoirs that have 10 milladarcy permeability, but they're not shales. So we, and that's obvious, we know that. And so if you just turn it over and blindly let it do whatever, you can get unphysical values. And so a lot of times what you have to come back in later and, and sort of do some, some manual tuning right, to, to ensure that it's not giving you unphysical values. And, and, uh, and the reason is if you just let it, if you just let it do, every, you know, put in unphysical values, then yeah, you can match the past, but that in no means, you, you know, are you going to be able to predict the future with a model like that. So, you know, I, I'll even ask the question before. I, I was actually talking to a Slumberjay developer one time. You, you guys have heard me kind of in class, like, I mean, I, we, we teach you guys this because it's the industry standard, finite differences, but this is like the worst numerical technology in the world. I mean, there's so much better... You know, in the, in the, in the, you know, I can design, I can design a finite element scheme that's optimally convergent. It means optimal means the best. Like you can't get more efficient than that. And I can do it within the framework of the mathematics of finite elements. And uh, so I was talking to this Summerjay developer one time, and, and I said, you know, why, why do you put all this physics in? You have all these computational, uh, compositional flow algorithms, and you're balancing on all these components. You're adding all this physics and all this physics and all this physics. And then you just give it away with the worst numerics you could use, uh, because we haven't really talked about it. But these, you know, these these finite differences—they they, you have a lot of numerical dispersion in the model. I mean, you, you saw that in the Buckley-Ebert problem, right? The analytic solution to the Buckley-Ebert problem—it's a really sharp front, right? And you know, if you use a coarse grid, it really just does a poor job at capturing that sharp front. You have to really refine the grid to the extent that it's sort of numerically intractable. Because you have to put so many, you know, in 1D it's not bad, but in a real, you know, 3D simulation, if you had to use that many grids to track the front everywhere, you never solve a problem. So anyway, I was having this conversation with the guy, and he told me, he said, well, if we didn't add all that physics, we wouldn't have enough parameters to history match. We wouldn't have enough knobs to turn, essentially. And I didn't really like that answer, but but he, at least he was honest. At least he was honest. And, you know, my response was, well, if you're going to do that, why even have a forward model? Why have equations? Like, just use machine learning algorithms, right? Machine learning algorithm can go and build a model, construct a model based on the data, and that's going to do just as good, at, uh, you know, if you're just so wildly off on all the parameters that there's no really no physics behind it, you can just use a machine learning algorithm. Right? Don't, even, don't even mess with it. So I think Dr. Lake probably agrees with me. Don't even mess with this. Just use machine learning algorithms. What's this model Well, I mean, the best technology we have is, is in the framework of finite elements. Yeah. It's because of the mathematical theory behind it. I mean, it, basically, the finite elements is a, is a generalization of all of these schemes, right? So in a minute, I'll show you a finite volume scheme. Well, finite volumes are, I mean, finite volumes are a special case of finite elements. And finite differences are a special case of finite volumes. Right? So the most general, most sophisticated thing is finite elements. And, and again, because of the mathematical theory behind it, I can construct schemes that are optimally convergent. Which means, you know, convergent means that's the right answer, right? And I want to get there as fast, you know, with, with, the, with the, when I say optimally convergent, you know, you know, imagine you have a reservoir and it's got one fracture in the center of it. And it's a shale reservoir or something. It's got one fracture. Well, that one fracture is going to, near that fracture, is going to have an extremely steep pressure gradient that goes from, you know, the, goes from the flow in the fracture out to basically no flow in the reservoir, right? And the, the pressure gradient is going to be really steep. Something like this, you know. So this is like pressure with distance. Well, and if I have one finite, 
grid, finite difference grid that covers that fracture. The best I, the best approximation I can do, to remember, because in a finite difference scheme, the pressure is constant everywhere within the grid block, right? So the best approximation I can do would be to average that and get something like that. Well, that line right there is not a very good approximation to that curve, right? So you say, well, use two blocks. Okay, still not that great. Three blocks. Still not that great. Okay. To, to actually capture this, I would need you know, enough blocks to resolve that thing, right? to resolve that gradient. But with a finite element scheme, I, I'm not constant within the element. Like I have, a, I have the option, well, in the standard setting, you have a polynomial field there. So linears or quadratus or cubics, you have some polynomial field. But if I have some knowledge of the solution, I can even enrich that field. I can even enrich that field such that um, I get that. And in fact, maybe I can show you guys at some point. But I mean, remember the buckley Webber problem? It took me like 200, final, 200 uh, grid blocks to even get a decent looking answer. I, I, I have a student working on an enriched finite element scheme that can match it almost exactly with 12 degrees of freedom versus 200. Right. So anyway, uh, so back, back to history matching. You know, these are common things that you would um, uh, change in the history matching. You know, you, you always want to limit the number of variables that you, you're trying to change, right? So you typically limit them to the things that you may not know, right? Because we, you, you, you log the well near the well bore, right? And so that's where you're sort of measuring permeability and porosity and all these other things. But then your grid block is on the sides of this room. Well, I mean, if you, can you imagine a rock in the world that's, that's constant properties for, you know, from here to the other side of the room? Uh, it, it doesn't happen. So you, you tend to want to only history match the things that you have the highest uncertainty about, like permeability. And you want to keep the number of uh, variables small because if you if you try to history match 100 variables then it's going to going to take forever okay so then you know these are some of the, the, the types of things so production rates pressure uh, bottom hole pressure arrival times so like if you had tracer data you could you could uh, history match arrival times different things like that so this is an example of what I was uh, talking about with in GPASS, they have this discrete fracture model. And so GPASS is a finite volume code. So you notice it's not a regular square grid, right? So in a finite volume code, essentially what you're doing is you're balancing fluxes across these faces. And you're doing, you know, you're solving algebraic system equations that balances all of them at once, OK? And so then if you have a mesh now that conforms to the fracture network, so your big, thick black lines you can imagine are fractures. And if your mesh conforms to it, like in that picture, then you could treat the fracture like essentially an element of zero thickness, right? So it has its own flux. And you can solve the transport equations along the fracture, uh, you know, because of course fluid's going to transport along the fracture uh, much faster than it's going to diffuse into the fracture. So you can treat the transport along the fracture like using real lubrication theory. And then you solve some. Uh, flux balance between the fracture itself and the rest of the matrix. And you can then solve these equations. There, there are also, uh, there are other techniques using sort of non-neighboring connections and other things that allow you to, even in a finite difference setting, where uh, fractures might cut the grid blocks in some way uh, to account for their presence uh, in a way that's not a dual por porosity model. So those are uh, some more recent work in the last few years by Dr. Sefanori's research group, and that's available in that GPASS code. Upscaling, this is a big area of research. I think uh, Dr. Balhoff does a lot of work in this area. And so upscaling could be kind of, in, in this picture, the idea is that uh, it could come, the, the, the upscaled information could come from laboratory experiments like core floods, or it could come from smaller scale computations itself. So the idea would be you can do some core flood, and then you, you, you sort of subdivide any grid cell into smaller subcells, feed that information into there, and then have some type of robust averaging procedure 
to get the global properties on the scale of a, a block into the size of this room, you know. And so, um, you know, it, when I say robust averaging features, it's, it's, it's generally not good enough to just take the average. You, ha you have to do something better than that. And so, uh, the, you know, the other idea is that, and, and I think, you know, maybe not in my lifetime, four years, but, but the future goal would be that you never do an experiment, right? That we know enough about the physics, we can build computational realizations at the poor scale, like, like that picture right there, and then you solve the Navier-Stokes equations in that poor scale model, right? Because there's no way, you know, there's no way we could build a model the size of this room, um, probably not in two lifetimes, build a, a poor scale model the size of this room and solve the Navier-Stokes equations everywhere fluid goes into it. It's never going to happen. But what we might be able to do is solve it on, a, say, a one millimeter by one millimeter block. We could do that now. Right? Solve the poor network or the poor scale calculation, not in average stage equations. Use that to compute then, not to measure, but to compute relative permeability curves. And then use those relative permeability curves in a larger scale simulation. The issue with this upscaling and the reason it's not just a solved problem is that there's multiple scales of heterogeneity, right? You know that from looking at a rock, right? If you look at it under a scanning electron microscope versus a laboratory microscope versus your naked eye uh, of a sample this big versus your naked eye of a sample this big versus your naked eye at the scale of the Grand Canyon, right? You see vast, you know, vast different heterogeneities, right? And how you connect and account for all those heterogeneities across link scales is an unsolved problem. Yeah. So, you, I mean, at the poor scale, we can, you know, one millimeter by one millimeter, we, we go to the laboratory and do uh, CT, micro CT, and we can get an exact picture of what the rock looks like. Well, I mean, that, yeah, that would be the hope, right? I mean, obviously, it would never be a deterministic problem. You'd have to do it statistically. And that's essentially, even at that small scale, that's what we do, right? You go to the lab, you measure a handful of these things, and then you use the measurements to compare to statistical realizations where the essentially the, the pores are computer generated, right? The poor networks are computer generated. And then you compare the results of your com computer generated, statistically built models to the things you measured. And you say, okay, now we, we know how to build these things stati that are statistically accurate, right? Because no, no two one millimeter by one millimeter blocks that I ever cut out of anywhere in the world are ever going to be identical, right? But on the average sense, they could be the same. They could have the same statistical properties. Essentially, that's what permeability is, right? It's a, it's a statistical property, right? It's, it's averaged over some, some, some volume. And it's just how you do the averaging in the upscaling is an area of research. And it's mainly associated with these heterogeneities, right? Because you see that little cube there. It just looks like a poor network. It doesn't, you don't see any vast like fracture flowing through the middle of it, right? But of course, real rocks have natural fractures in them and other things. And if you don't account for those as you go up the link scales, you, you, you'll be off uh, at, the, at, the, at the largest link scale. We already talked about it, fully implicit, but this is sort of a using fully implicit model uh, in, in instead of MPES, right? So instead of MPES, we could solve everything together, right? So it's the same sort of idea. Um, you, you have this residual, right? It was F in that other equation, but now your, your F vector contains both the pressures and the saturations, and you use newton raphson method to converge on it. Uh, when we, I, I never use impasse. When my students do these type of calculations, we just solve it implicitly. We have big computers, no big deal. This is more accurate. This is more accurate to, to do it that way. So um, yeah, this, is, this is sort of a, a revisiting what I said earlier, a little bit different symbols. But basically, you, have, you write your equation, so you have some residual. It's a function of the unknowns, x n plus 1. You put everything on the right-hand side, and you try to drive that residual to 0 via this newton raphson iteration. So here, the, the residual, this is the, that Jacobian matrix we were talking about. And then you just solve this equation for d dx, and then you update, and you keep doing this until until you've reached some convergence.
So in, another advanced topic is in compositional simulation. So in compositional simulation, you know, you're writing the balance equation for every hydrocarbon component, methane, opane, propane, methane, ethane, propane, everything, right? Of course, in, in, in any oil, right, <laughs> you could have 20 components in there. Um, so a lot of times what we do is you, you'd lump those together into pseudo components. I mean, it's essentially what the black oil model is. You're, you're, you're loping, lumping everything into three phases, right? Um, you don't. You could do less than that. You, know, you could you could lump them into five or seven, or you know it's your choice you know, how you lump them. Uh, but then you just solve the mass balance equations for. So this is the <coughs> this is the mass balance equation. Uh, it's actually the vector diffusion equation for every con for any concentration of the species. So you can solve for all the concentrations, and you can solve this again fully implicit or now. Impact, you know, implicit pressure, explicit concentration. Um, you'd have to use, in this case, you, you have to use uh, flash calculations and equations of state to, to understand the phase compositions and all that to determine the densities. Another technique is an alternative to MPES is called streamlines. Uh, I don't think we have anyone here that really does streamline simulation. You know, it's an area of, of focus or research. Uh, the, a lot of the guys that pioneered this work are at Texas A&M and there's some guys at Stanford. Um, so what you do here is, it's, it's in a way, it's the first step is the same as impasse, right? So we're going to solve the pressure field. Right? So we solve the pressure field. And now we know the pressure field everywhere. We can use Darcy's law to compute a velocity vector. Right? So we have a velocity vector for the flow at every simulation point, or every grid point. Right? And then from the, that velocity field, we can sort of stitch them together to draw lines. Right? So you sort of just connect, smoothly connect all the velocity vectors to draw lines. And that gives you an idea of how the flow goes in the reservoir. And then what you do is you solve the transport equations along those lines. Right? So you Solve the pressure field, trace the lines, and then solve the the, uh, uh, the transport along the lines. Okay, so these are streamlines. The so-called advantage is, is a, you know computational speed. Um, you know, <laughs> I have a real problem with this because th there's no convergence theory that I know of associated with streamlines. So who cares if you're fast if you're wrong, right? If you can't tell me that you're right, or at what rate you're converging at, who cares how fast you solve the problem, right? This is as relevant as I can, I can solve an equation with one grid block, right? It's wrong, but it was fast, right? You know, you know. So, so I, you know, this, this is the, the claim, right? It's not my claim. This is the people who work on streamlines claim is that it's computationally fast. But given that there's no convergence theory to show me what rate you know, that you're converging, there's no estimation of the error, and therefore, who cares if you're fast? Because you're wrong, unless you can prove to me you're not. Um, you know, I can see this, this, this part, because in convective-dominated flows, uh, you know, now this this whole issue of upwinding is gone, right? I mean, you're sort of just solving the equations on a one-dimensional line, so th you know, there's no issues associated with stability of convective-dominated flows. Um, you know. You know, and you can you can solve the sort of Navier-Stokes equations quite easily in, in one dimension. Um, you know, the, the 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 disadvantage is diffusive dominated flows because, uh, you know, it's convection dominated. You flow along the line fine, but there's no transport from one line to the next, in that sense. You know, the, the two streamlines next to each other, which is where you know, possibly diffusion would dominate. So that's another alternative. Uh, but it, you know it's it's worth talking about because it's a it is a major area of overall in petroleum engineering of research. Of course, all these sort of advanced topics that we talked about today, and the reason we don't really talk about them more than an overview in this class is because they're all very computationally expensive, right? So they have to run to run large problems. You have to run them on supercomputers, okay? And so uh, you know most of the large scale codes we use are are uh, massively parallel in the sense that uh, 
they run on supercomputers, and a, and a supercomputer, a typical supercomputer, is a distributed network supercomputer, right? So basically, you have essentially just a bunch of these computers that are connected in parallel, okay? And they can communicate with each other really fast. In fact, you know, the, the, the fastest use a, a system called InfiniBand, which is something like 50 gigabits a second between com computers, right? So then what you do is you take your large-scale simulation and you break it up, right? So you, you know, imagine you have, um, you know, a, a million by a million. You could break it up into a, th a thousand, a thousand, thousand by thousand chunks, right? And then you send all of those off for their own computing. If you had a thousand processors, you send all of those off to be computed, and you know your speed up would theoretically be, if you wrote the code well, a thousand times. Right? Your thing has to be a thousand times faster. Of course, it's not almost no code scales perfectly like that because there is this communication time, right? If I if I take two chunks of the domain, well, that should be touching each other. Of course, think about your half transmissibilities, right? So you, you have to one one block has to have information from the other one, right? Well, that other block is in memory on a whole different computer, and so it has to access that memory through this transmission of data, right? They have to pass messages back and forth. Um, and so there is, uh, so this is really a, a lot of what I do, you know, with my background at Sandia. Uh, and this at least for seven years, I wrote computer code to run on massively parallel machines, right? And so we're lucky at UT that we have one of the world's fastest. At the Texas Advanced Computing Center, TAC, we have uh, like the sixth fastest computer in the world, right? Stampede. So we're pretty lucky to have that. And, you know, it's rare, very rare at a university. Right? The only ones faster are at U.S. national laboratories and, and other government labs in other countries. Usually China will have like the first or second fastest computer, but they don't really use it. They just build it for like to say we have the world's fastest computer. Right? <laughs> I mean, they don't really have like the engineers that write the software. Because again, you can't just take your MATLAB code and throw it up there and get a thousand times speed up. You have to write the code. You have to write the algorithms in a way that exploit the type of parallelism that's there. So this is a little bit about the codes that were there earlier. I won't, we don't really have time to go into them. UT Chem, uh, this is one thing neat about IPARGS is you can actually run multi-physics and multi-numerics in the sense that you can, you can have one reservoir and you can break it up. And this is sort of an extreme example. But imagine you had like an aquifer feeding a reservoir, a black oil reservoir. Well, in the aquifer, it's perfectly fine to do one single phase flow, likely, right? And so, you know, if you're doing single phase flow, you're solving two or less equations at every good block. So you can, you can have your, your single phase flow, it's t butted up against a reservoir, a black oil reservoir, and then you're solving the multi-physics equations there, right? And, uh, you know, the way that th that's do that done is through these so-called mortar methods. Uh, so again, these mortars are sort of you can think of these like grids or elements of zero thickness that, that help to balance the flux between the other blocks, right? So the mortar, you know, like glue, right? You know, like building blocks, mortar, right? So uh, you can also have multi-numerics in the sense that you can have some of your domains doing impasse, some of them doing fully implicit, you know, if you had a need for more accuracy in one part of the domain or something like that. I think this is sort of less important than this. This, this is a good idea. Although these mortar methods aren't free, right? So it's not like so. There's some gain in, in that you're you know solving fewer equations here, but to balance the flux between the domains, there's some expense associated with that. The accuracy, yeah, yeah you could do impasse there, and you know if you had if you had real steep your your, your um, your fully implicit schemes are going to be more accurate where you have real steep gradients. And so, you, you know, if you had real steep gradients, you had a well there or something like that, you might want to do fully implicit there and, and so otherwise. So I think this is the last slide. The idea is, you know, sort of where we are and where we're going. Now, you know, millions of unknowns to billions of unknowns. We, in fact, do billions of unknowns now, just not commonplace. But I think, you know, in the, in the next few years, as we get exascale computers and other things, Billions of unknowns will be done regularly. And then really a lot of the, the applications in new physics are associated with unconventionals. And unconventionals, it's very important uh, that you couple in your geomechanics. 
which is not typically done in traditional reservoirs. So who's taking reservoir geomechanics next semester? You'll have me again. We'll write more code. <laughs> not as much as this class. <laughs>